um, YouTube. Everybody, I just want to let you know that for the BLS and the CPR instructor monitoring courses, this is a safe learning environment. Our instructor candidates are allowed to make mistakes and also our students are allowed to make mistakes. Um, so what we do here in Jacksonville, Florida is, my name is Eunice Mathis, I'm a registered nurse and I'm the owner of Florida Training Academy, is that we train instructors. We train students who are interested in actually um, providing um, CPR training to others in the community and within their, and at their jobs. And so who we have for today is we have Matthew, he's an instructor candidate, he attended, he attended the instructor course on yesterday, and today is going to be his monitoring session where he actually uses his AHA resources in order to co-teach a class. And over here we have a wonderful student named Tony. Tony's going to be a student today in our BLS class, and so at the completion of this class today, we will have a student who has their BLS card, and then we will also have an instructor candidate who will trans um, transition into the actual instructor role for the American Heart Association. So again, safe learning environment. We cannot show the American Heart Association video on um, camera, and so you will be able to hear it, but you won't be able to see it. If I can go back and edit the video to remove some of those lone areas where it's just a video and no movement, I will. However, if you are a true you know, person who is interested in becoming a CPR instructor, you may actually appreciate the fact that we didn't edit the video and cut anything out. So let's go ahead and get started with our class. Welcome everybody. Welcome, how are you doing? All right, very good, nice to work with you. Um, I always talk about safety first. And so with safety, we have the one way in, one way out. Our restroom is all the way down the hall and usually about halfway through the class, I'll give you an opportunity to use the restroom. With just one student, this class should not take more than two hours to complete, okay? And then, um, do you need coffee or any water? No. Okay, so we do have a nourishment station. I've not had you sign in yet, and that's one of the first things we have you do, and so I'm gonna get that roster to you now. Okay, awesome. And Matthew, would you tell him what, uh, what he's checking for on the roster? Uh, you're checking to make sure that your name and email are correct and your phone number so you can contact you. Mm -hmm. And if everything's correct, what does he do after that? And then you're going to sign. Uh huh, he can sign in under notes. Sign in under notes. Okay, there you go. Thank you. And so this is how you receive your e card from the American Heart Association. Even though that's on two lines, it's because um, it was a long email mm -hmm. address, it's still it's, um, one line altogether. Awesomeness. So today, in order for you to become a certified as a um, BLS provider, that's what the American Heart uses to say student. For you to be a BLS student, you will have to complete a 25 question multiple choice examination, no pressure. I know you have your ebook there. You can also take notes. And we start off with the review. You'll also have to perform some skills. And at the very end, we'll show you those skills checklists. We're gonna watch the video. The video is practice while watching. Um, but the video is gonna do some of the talking, but it hasn't taught the student how to use this method. So it's like, it's, it's like, okay, well, we have the video, but we also have the human, the instructor there for a reason to make sure hand placement, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, E-cards, please check your email. So I'll teach Matthew how to issue an e-card before we leave here today. If you do not receive it in your email, in your inbox, please check your spam mail because we have sent it, it's just sometimes they get lost in the sauce. If you still don't have it, you have my cell phone number, just email me or text me and I can send you a separate link to where you can actually retrieve your um, e-card. That's really important when you're dealing with schools and with hospitals because sometimes those servers will reject the AHA emails or treat them as spam. And so if you get everybody's company email address, more than likely you're gonna have 50 people contact you saying they did not receive the card. So you want their personal number. Personal is better, mm -hmm. yes it is. And everybody who attends an American Heart Association course has to have an individual email address. So if you have a family of four and everybody usually uses mom email address, they cannot do that in the AHA class, okay? All right, so pass and score of 84%. If you miss more than four questions, you did not fail you've earned an opportunity to remediate and just stay here a little bit longer. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and go through our review. Excellent. All right, so Tony, tell me, why are you taking CPR? Or why are you becoming, a, um, I know you're interested in um, becoming an instructor, but yes. why are you taking a BLS um, instructor course in the future? Because I want to uh, be able to provide uh, services to the public. Okay, yes. wonderful, wonderful. And then Matthew, you are teaching at a school, yeah. a college? I'm at USF and I wanted to be like the CPR coordinator at the CMS program. Perfect. All right. So, not on your paper. What does CPR stand for? Cardiovascular. And, and oh. 
Yes. Or on their recitation. Yes, let's 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 <laughs> clean it up for you. All right, now I want you to write this down because okay. everybody have to they take these classes, but they really it's like, ah, oh, yeah, I need a CPR card. Right. CPR stands for cardio, pulmonary, pulmonary resuscitation. But you pulled that fourth at nine something in the morning. I'm really proud of you. <laughs> All right, so cardio, what organ in the body? The heart. Heart. Yeah. Pulmonary, what organs? That's a great question. I don't know. So and so that's why because you have we're teaching these medical terms to non-medical professionals. He can do safety all day long. You start talking about those organs in the body, <laughs> you know, it's a little bit different. Um, so pulmonary will be the lungs. Okay. Cardio pulmonary resuscitation. Okay. Resuscitation, we're performing skills to help um, save this person's life. And what are those two skills? You can answer, Matthew. See, we're doing CPR and we're doing uh, rescue so, breath. So what does um when you say CPR? Oh, chest compressions. Chest, chest compressions. compressions and rest yeah. Yes. Look at them over there writing dissertation. I promise it's going to get easier after this. Okay. I will not ask you all these complicated <laughs> questions. <laughs> Perfect. All right. And so now on your sheet, I've wrote, written down some of the most common abbreviations or medical terms that the American Heart Association uses in their courses. Mm -hmm. And the first one is um, CAB. When you think of CAB, that is your priority for whenever someone's in cardiac arrest. You'll know when someone's in cardiac arrest because the lights go off. It's like they're standing and then they're going to mm -hmm. go out. You're tapping and you're shouting, no response. You can immediately call for help before you ever feel for a pulse. Okay. At the point where a person has changed to where they're up talking to you and now they are unresponsive, that's immediate medical attention. Yeah. All right, so we're tapping and we're shouting. And we're going to feel for the carotid pulse on the side nearest us with two fingers mm -hmm. while looking for chest rise. Okay. 10 seconds is all you get to determine if this person is in cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. um, so CAB, once we determine they're in cardiac arrest, what is our priority? What's the C on CAB? Oh, heart. Okay. What does it stand for from the paper? Oh, circulation. Circulation, mm -hmm. which means we have to do chest compressions. Right. Whenever we start doing those chest compressions, the oxygen that's in the blood didn't disappear. It's just not moving. Right. So that's why we should not be focusing on airway and breathing once someone is deceased. Once their heart is stopped, we can focus on airway and breathing once our team members come with the first aid kit right. and then we can give the reps. Okay. Um, so your job is high quality CPR. High quality CPR has different components. We talked about um, not taking longer than 10 seconds. So we call that minimizing interruptions. How fast do we compress per minute, Matthew? 100 to 120. 100 to 120 compressions. What song would that be? Stand alive. Stand alive by the Bee Gees, yeah. all right? <laughs> <laughs> and so if we are stopping to give breaths, okay, we would we call that a compression to breath ratio. And it's actually on your paper. Um, what's the compression to breath ratio? How many compressions follow by how many breaths? Uh, 30 for five cycles. Uh huh. But that's two. how many compressions. So we say 30 to two. 30 to 2. 30 to 2. Mm -hmm. So after 30 compressions, we do two, two breaths. Breath. And then for five cycles, how many minutes should that take approximately? It's next to the five minutes. Next to the two five minutes. cycles. Two minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you have help, what happens after five cycles? Oh, switch. Switch oh, out. Okay. Switch, okay. Yeah. switch out. The next term that's on your paper is AED. What does the AED stand for, Matthew? Automated external defibrillator. Awesome. I didn't ask you this yesterday. Hard question. You ready for it? No. <laughs> Can you use an AED if someone has an implanted AED defibrillator? Oh, tell me, implanted defibrillator or pacemaker? Yeah. Yes, you can. But what's the exception? You can't do what? You can't go right over it. You can't go right over okay. it. And so the video is going to talk about that. I'm just doing a review before you press play. Right. So it's on the outside. Um, so the, the, the um, implanted defibrillator, you're going to see an elevation beneath their skin, and that usually tells you that there's something beneath there. It okay, could you be, can feel it. You can, okay. and you can feel it too, but that could be like someone's um, chemotherapy port. It may not have a needle or anything attached to it right now because they're not receiving the chemo treatment right, right now but you'll be able to see something beneath the skin. Okay. If you see something, don't put the pads there, okay? okay. Yes. All right, so when the AED arrives to the scene, what's the first thing we do? Turn it on. Turn it on. Second thing we do is what? Listen for the prompts. Listen for the prompts, because um, you are responsible for wherever you work. I need you to learn how to use those AEDs on your job sites. Right. And what a lot of people will do is they'll leave that up to the safety person or the nurse and my response is, what if it's the safety person or the nurse who's actually in cardiac arrest? 
if no one else knows how to work the equipment except for that one person, we're going to be doomed. Right. And so all you would do is just simply take a picture of it and then go to YouTube, find that make and model, and then just watch the training video on that particular piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. What does ROSC stand for? Do you remember? Return of Spontaneous Circulation. Teaching 17 year olds, they have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> it's in parentheses. <laughs> What's on your paper? What does ROSC stand for? Pulse return. The pulse returns. So when the American Heart Association is saying all these terms as an instructor, we have to actually break these terms down so that our students will understand. Right. And that way it makes it um, it makes it more more relatable. Okay. All right, so we talked about AED, we talked about CAV, we talked about ROS. Mm -hmm. Ventricular fibrillation is one of those abnormal heart rhythms that the heart will go in and that's when the person will usually collapse. Without an EKG, without medical um, you know, equipment there on site, that's what we use the AED for. The AED determines whether or not this person's in a shockable rhythm. And if their heart is quivering, it's going to deliver, it's going to let you know to deliver a shock so that we can try to reorganize that energy. Okay. To help you pass your test, there's a term that I want you, to, a word I want you to write down, actually a whole sentence. Okay. The AED mm -hmm. normalizes mm -hmm. an abnormal heart rhythm. So that's the goal when it sends that shock. It's to try to reorganize that energy that's right now disorganized. We'll talk about children and infants whenever we get to that point in the video. Um, do you have any questions on what we've covered so far for adults? And this is just a preview right. review before we actually press play. No, no, no. All, right. All right, awesome, let's go ahead and press play. Any notes you write, you can utilize on your test and then uh, we will, of course, allow you to access your ebook. All right, so Matthew, there's two different tracks, and this is important because pre-hospital would be paramedics, EMTs, firefighters, et cetera, somebody who would more than likely be performing CPR on the ground. In facility provider would be someone who's performing CPR on a bed. It actually has a bed there. So today during our class, Tony, we're gonna use these tables as our simulated hospital beds. If you cannot compress deeply enough on the hospital bed, that's when we're gonna ask you to go to the floor. Okay. okay? Yes, and then just FYI, just extra information, your hospital beds, we usually have a CPR mode. So if your patient's up comfortable in the bed, elevated, there's going to be a lever you can pull. Okay. Flattens the bed. You call the code. You lower the rail on the side nearest you. The air escapes the mattress. You get on top of the bed and start doing your compressions while you're waiting for your team members to come with a backboard. Okay. What you don't want to do is just stand there and do nothing. Right. Okay. any time you can encounter a victim of cardiac arrest because about every 90 seconds a person dies of sudden cardiac arrest but with the training you receive today your actions can give a victim the best chance of survival sudden cardiac arrest occurs without warning or within just a few minutes after symptoms appear the term heart attack is often mistakenly used to describe cardiac arrest Although a heart attack may cause cardiac arrest and sudden death, they are different conditions. But it's important to call emergency services for both. There's more information on the differences between heart attack and cardiac arrest in your provider manual. Throughout today's course, we'll review the BLS skills you have learned previously, including adult BLS, child BLS, infant BLS, use of an AED, and high performance teams. In this video, we'll revisit each skill and use practice while watching, where you'll practice along with the video. Before you're tested on adult and infant BLS skills, you'll have plenty of time to practice. First, let's talk about the two adult chains of survival. One is for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and one is for in-hospital cardiac arrest. Both chains have six links, but the links differ slightly. Both chains include activation of the emergency response system, high quality CPR, early defibrillation, post cardiac arrest care, which may be provided in the cath lab or the intensive care unit, and recovery. For the in-hospital chain, the difference is the first link. 
It focuses on early recognition and prevention of cardiac arrest with patient monitoring and assessment, and if necessary, rapid response by the medical emergency team when a patient's condition starts to deteriorate. For the out-of-hospital chain, the difference is the fourth link, which focuses on advanced resuscitation. In this link, a multi-rescuer team arrives and takes over CPR and may perform additional advanced interventions. In this practice session, you'll check for scene safety, check for responsiveness, practice chest compressions, and provide breaths by using your pocket mask with a one-way valve. You'll practice while watching by doing three sets of 30 compressions with two breaths. Okay, so Matthew, um, in your book right now, all right, so we just press play, and so when it pauses, um, could you read this aloud? Have students position themselves at the side of their mannequins per the video instruction. Tell them that they will practice the entire one rescuer adult VOS sequence, including scene safety and assessment, in three sets of 30 compressions with two breaths at the end of each set of compressions. <coughs> Tell students to compress at a rate of 100 to 120 per minute, making sure compressions are at least two inches or five centimeters deep and allowing complete chest recoil. Right, and so then it talks about the steps. Now, what's good is that once he stands up and we make sure that he knows how to work the equipment, we can press play, but then we're following along and these are what the expectations are. And so as far as getting your equipment out for adult, um, for the one rescue adult VLS, we know to have our adult mannequin and our pocket mask. What happens with new instructors is you want to teach too much too soon and you want to pull out the AED. That's going to totally confuse your students. Right now it's just one mannequin, one pocket mask with a one-way valve. Um, for your bag, because we may have to come over and help you. Okay. Can I get you to put your bag yes. in this other chair? That's a nice bag, by the way. Thank you. Yes. Right, and so I'm going to take this chair away. Okay. And now when you stand, mm -hmm. stand up, just push your chair over some because we want to make sure that we allow you to get to your patient. If you'll move your mannequin closer to you. And then let's go ahead and pre-assemble your pocket mask with your one-way valve. So if you'll just go ahead and open up that plastic. I know, right? Pressure. All, all eyes on you right now. Awesomeness. Before I press play on the video, he's never seen this equipment before, to my knowledge, or it's been two years. I like to make sure they know how to work the equipment. All right, so hand placement. Don't compress on the throat. Don't compress on the xiphoid process. We can actually um, damage or break ribs. You don't want to break the xiphoid process, the very end of the breastbone, because the liver sits beneath it, and we can lacerate the liver. So while we're saving their lives, they're hemorrhaging internally. We don't want that. So pretend a person has a perfect nipple line, you will interlock your hands, okay? And then because we're on the elevated surface, awesome, go ahead and press down, and then bring your shoulders over and press straight down. You're gonna hear a click, awesome. And then when you release, we call that chest recoil. The benefit of chest recoil is because you allow the heart time to refill with blood. So if you always apply pressure, mm -hmm. you're doing a whole bunch of work, but the heart can't move enough to get any blood back into the chambers. Mm -hmm. All right, so now that light that was flashing mm -hmm. indicates we were going way too slow. <laughs> All right, so now if you give me 30 compressions, let's go. One, two, three, four, perfect, six, seven, eight. two likes throughout. Now you get 10 seconds to give two breaths. Go ahead and put that mask down. Head tilt, chin lift. Give a breath. I'm going to watch for chest rise. So really put your mouth on and give a breath. One. Good. And now release. And so now you bring, get some air for yourself mm -hmm. and then go back down again and give your second breath. Two. Pause. And so as soon as you see chest rise, you can stop. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so now that he has practiced everything, mm -hmm. now I'm going to watch you as you watch him because the video is practiced while watching, okay. okay? So he knows how to use everything. He has to say and do everything the animated character on the TV says and does. Mm -hmm. um, would you show me how to check the carotid pulse? Because I did not have you do that. On the side nearest you, so usually with your left hand, mm -hmm. I'm gonna to touch you and I'll give you sanitizer. Mm -hmm. Left hand down, mm -hmm. and then that allows you to look at the chest simultaneously, mm -hmm. all right? Because you have to look at the chest. I see you looking here, bring your eyes this way. So you're feeling for the pulse mm -hmm. and you're looking for chest rise simultaneously. Okay. How many seconds? 
No more than 10. No more than 10. Right. Okay. I'm watching you as you watch him. You'll press play or DVD so player. What if, I, what if I, mm -hmm. three seconds in? No. Well, three seconds, he could have a really shallow pulse or okay. really you want to give them an opportunity to okay. prove they're dead before you crack their wrist. I got it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Do that full assessment. Ten right. whole seconds. Ten whole seconds. Ten whole seconds. All right. And so then once you, I'm going to move this book back down because once you press play, the focus is not on anything else except for making sure your student's doing what they're supposed to be doing. And if you need to pause the, the video, because maybe he's not going at the same pace, you can pause the video. Okay. okay. Awesome. <laughs> and everything it does, you have to do. Okay. Here we go. In three, two, one. Just tap and shout. Hey, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Help, someone help. Someone help. Okay, have a little bit of help. Carotid pulse. Good job. Activate the emergency response and get an AED. Give me an AED, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10-15 minutes we know if we keep going it's a possibility we can get the heart by going but what's going to be the brain function I got you. So, okay, yes. yes and then the last time that we'll stop or one of the last times is if they achieve ROS and what does ROS stand for? <laughs> return pulse return <laughs> and that's the goal of high quality CPR yes, awesome All right. so you're welcome to have a seat and then after that you'll go back to your book and tell me what's the next segment Yes, we did that. Um, so now, what? Oh, here it is. Yeah. So we're gonna. So I, should I read it out? Yes. All right. The video will show and discuss AED use, including AED special considerations, such as if the person has a hairy chest, is immersed in is immersed in water, or has water covering the chest, has an implanted defibrillator or a pacemaker, has a transdermal medication patch, or any other object on the surface of skin where the AED pad needs to be placed is an infant or child less than eight years of age and is a pregnant woman. All right, 
Awesome. Okay. And so here you are. Your press play. The video doesn't pause on its own. So if we don't catch it in time, it's going to go straight to rescue breaths. Okay. Not the end of the world. You need to pause it late or show rescue breaths too. And then whenever the student stands up, we'll review the ADB and rescue breaths. Okay. okay. And I'll be back in to help with ADB. Yes, perfect. So remember, press play. And then you just won't let the video play. So okay. you're, you're still seated for like two more minutes. Okay. In this section, we will cover use of an AED and a bag mask device. AEDs vary according to the model, but all operate in basically the same way. You must be familiar with the AED used in your particular setting. The four universal steps for operating an AED are as follows. Power on the AED and follow the AED prompts. Attach the AED pads to the victim's bare chest. Follow the placement diagrams on the pads. The AED will prompt you to clear the victim so that it can analyze the heart rhythm. If the AED advises a shock, it will tell you to clear the victim. If no shock is needed and after any shock delivery, immediately resume CPR, starting with chest compressions. You'll need to consider a few special situations when using an AED. First, if the person's chest is so hairy that the pads can't adhere to the skin, you may quickly shave the area if a razor is provided. If no razor is provided and you have two sets of pads, apply one set to the hairy chest. <coughs> if the chest hair prevents the pads from contacting the skin, the AED should tell you to check the pads. If it does, press them down more firmly. If they still aren't sticking, rip the pads off forcefully, removing the chest hair. Then apply a new set of pads to the bare skin. Excessive water on the victim's chest can also be a problem. It could allow the shock to travel through the water between the pads, ultimately preventing delivery of an effective shock dose to the victim's heart. If a victim is lying in water, quickly move them to a dry area before using an AED. But if the victim is lying on snow or in a small puddle, you can use the AED. And if the chest is covered with water or sweat, Wipe it off before attaching the AED pads, but wipe the chest quickly. It doesn't have to be completely dry. Some people have an implanted pacemaker or defibrillator in the same place where you would put the AED pads. These devices look like a round or square lump that's smaller than a deck of cards. If you see this lump, avoid putting a pad directly over it. Also, don't place a pad directly over a medicine patch. If a medicine patch is located where you need to place a pad, Take the patch off and quickly wipe the chest before applying the pad. If the victim is wearing an undergarment containing metal, be sure to apply the AED pads on bare skin, avoiding contact with the garment. You should familiarize yourself with the AED model in your workplace. Regardless of the type of AED, remember to turn it on first and follow the audible prompts that will lead you through the rest of the steps. AED kits may include additional emergency equipment, such as scissors, razors, wipes, gloves, and a barrier device. These items may also be found in a separate emergency or first aid kit. We'll pause here to allow you to get familiar with the AED in your class today. Your instructor will show you all that's included in the kit and demonstrate the correct way to place the pads on a victim. All right, okay. All right, so there were, um, you're still welcome to have a seat. There was Providing a effect, there was a situation the video did not cover. Can you use an AED on a pregnant mother? When in doubt, save lives. So what's so the yes. answer? Yes. yes. Whatever damage you think the AED, that shock could cause to the baby, right now mom's heart right. doesn't, it's not contracting, so the placenta isn't receiving any blood, yes, so the baby's dying. Okay. Right, so yes, use the AED on mom. Okay. Why are women more likely to die if they sustain sudden cardiac arrest outside of a hospital? It's something about our anatomy. Okay. I'm interested in knowing. You're interested in knowing. Okay. Breast. Oh, breast. Okay. Whenever you watch TV shows, if someone goes into sudden cardiac arrest, they usually always show men. Right. What they're not telling you is that women and men suffer sudden cardiac arrest at the same rates, 50 and 50. It's mm -hmm. like, so women are also dying from sudden cardiac arrest, but if they're around men, men are less likely to touch the chest or expose the chest. Right. If they don't expose the chest, guess what never gets applied? That's right. 
So as a um, safety manager, as someone who's going to be teaching CPR in the community in the future, mm -hmm. um, you still want to be teaching those men that the Good Samaritan law would protect them if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And 911 is on the phone. Right. They can still perform chest compressions on top of clothing. Okay. If they don't feel comfortable exposing the chest, keep doing high quality CPR on top of clothing. And when those advanced rescuers arrive, they can expose the chest and apply the pads. Yes, right. If no one does <clears throat> anything, what's going to happen to that woman's chance of survival? Don't yeah. sit down. Yes, okay. All right. So, and you're welcome to um, stay seated for right now. AED, mm -hmm. what's the first thing we do when you arrive to the scene? You power it on. Power it on. I don't like talking over it, so I'm going to talk through it first, okay. and then I'll allow you to practice with it. All right. Perfect. So we're going to power it on. It's going to tell us... Um, after we power it on, we need to listen. Our device is going to say, apply the pads. Okay. And your pads have an illustration. It has an um, um, diagram. It tells you how to place the pads. You peel and stick, peel and stick. For classroom purposes, I don't care if you peel. It doesn't matter. If you want to peel, you can. It's just sometimes if you don't peel, this one starts sliding. Right. Okay. So we're going to avoid the nipple, peel and stick. Avoid the nipple, peel and stick. Mm -hmm. The strongest part of the heart is at the base where that crease is. Okay. So you don't want the pad so far down like towards the stomach. You mm -hmm. want it near the crease of the breast. Yes, Our device is then going to say, it's gonna be flashing. Mm -hmm. And this is where you connect it. Okay. It is now analyzing. It's trying to determine if the person's in ventricular fibrillation or another shockable rhythm. Mm -hmm. If we're touching, it's going to pick up our normal rhythm. Gotcha. So whenever um, it's analyzing, we say the word clear. Everyone say clear. 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 And that means no one should be touching. Okay. If you're working in like a warehouse or a place where people, um, there are not a lot of first responders or medical personnel, mm -hmm. we're using the AED as if it's a manual defibrillator, like what we have in hospitals where you see like the paddles. We don't right. use paddles anymore, right. we use pads. <laughs> But that's a person who's operating everything. With the American Heart Association, they have us using an AED as if it's a manual defibrillator. So this is going to tell you, um, shock advised, do not touch the victim. Okay. But if you're a BLS provider, that means that you're like a professional rescuer, um, you're supposed to go back and do compressions while it's charging. Okay. So when it's analyzing, clear. 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 When it's charging, compress. Yes. If you're compressing and I press this button, are you going to like me? No. No. <laughs> so before we press this button, because it's going to start flashing and let us know it's fully charged, we have to say clear. clear. Okay. That means anyone who's touching the person, the bed, wherever they are, need to back away. The operator of the AED presses the shock button. There's no residual charge. We go right back into chest compressions. Okay, so... Come on over here, Mr. Tom. All right, so I'm going to be the rescuer who's doing chest compressions. You are the person who just brought the AED to the scene. You are the operator of the AED. I only listen to you. I don't listen to the AED. Because in the real world, in the hospitals, our machines don't talk. That's true. That's it. Okay. And so you're watching him. Okay. All right, so AED arrives. I'm doing chest compressions. Apply pads to the rear chest. Plug in pads oh, to the rear chest. Next to flashing light. Apply pads. Plug in connector. Analyzing the heart clear. rhythm. Clear. There you go. Do not touch the patient. Shock advised. All right, go ahead. Continue for first. Charging. There you go. Four, five. Stay clear of patient. The flash. Eleven, twelve. Deliver shock. All right, clear. Press the orange button. Now, shock delivered. Flip this tower to compress. Oh, go to CPR. Let's see if it catches it. Not too fast. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Great job, no bones. That's our new high five. Great job. All right, so do you know the name of that tone? Metro. Call it the Metro phone? <laughs> Rhymes. <laughs> so metronome. No, metronome. What's the purpose of the metronome? It's to tell you exactly how 
past or slow to go. Very good. When it comes to your compressors. Would you tell him for classroom purposes only, we're turning off the AC? Yeah, for classroom purposes, we're turning off the AC. Okay. And in the rural world, you would never so even if you bring someone back, mm -hmm. if they get lost, you don't take the AD pads off. Okay. Because like the thing of Demar Hamlin, he like she told me this yesterday and it makes sense. And like so, they they brought it back three times, but you have to keep really? the AD pads have to be kept on. Mm -hmm. So the pulse return, and then you have to keep the AD pads in case you have to shock again. Okay. Yes, okay. it's going to reanalyze every two minutes. Okay. And so um, they can keep these on till they get to their destination. Their destination for you, if you're um. Um, at your job site, EMT. Right. Okay, the EMT is going to keep these pads on all the way throughout until they get them to the hospital. Okay. So every time they get to another level of care, that agency, that organization puts on their AED. Okay. And we're going to keep this on until we can figure out the cause of the arrest, um, and so uh, or until we can prevent a rearrest. Okay. Yeah. You have any questions as an instructor? You have any questions as a student? No. So don't tell them to stop while I'm applying the pads. Yes. I need to work hard. So yes. Yeah. You yeah, it's like you want to keep doing those compressions. Yeah. It ma matters more to do that than like help them move the perfect right. Okay. So you work, we're like really close and intimate. Remember your work area because as a BLS instructor, you can teach heart saver students. And so if you're teaching lay persons, those people who are not professional rescuers, mm -hmm. do not confuse their lives. Have them use the AED exactly as it states. Right. Okay. But if you start teaching your safety professionals, those managers who would have to manage incidents, they need to work as a team. Yes, Keep doing those compressions while someone's applying those pads. Perfect. Okay. And then same thing for you. When you're out there teaching, know your audience. And if it's heart saver, just as stated. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Let's have a seat. Great job. Right. So I do apologize. I'm yes. going to move your table down. You're fine. You remain seated. Um, would you help me move this table? Because it's going to dry a lot. Thank you. Because we want to make sure that he has room. And now. Thank you so much. Because the next segment will be reps, okay. and now he has room to actually practice his rescue reps. Yeah, yeah. And now he can press play, and I have a bag pass device behind you. Ventilation is critical to successful high quality CPR, especially in respiratory related emergencies such as drowning, anaphylaxis, and asthma. Guidelines recommend against excessive ventilation during CPR and research suggests that some rescuers are less confident and less effective when using a bag mask device on their own without assistance. Because using a bag mask device is such an important skill and is common in the healthcare setting, we'll work on it now. Bag mask devices consist of a ventilation bag and a face mask, and they come in a variety of sizes. You can also use supplemental oxygen with a bag mask device. To begin, position yourself directly above the person's head. You'll use the EC clamp technique to hold the mask in place. To do this, apply the mask by first placing the cushion at the narrow end of the mask onto the bridge of the person's nose. Then lower the mask fully onto the face, watching for the cushion to bulge as it initially seals against the face. Form a C with the thumb and index finger of one hand and press down on the dome of the mask toward the face to further seal the rim of the mask. The remaining three fingers of that same hand should form an E to reach past the edge of the mask along the bony rim of the jaw. To tilt the head back, lift the jaw toward the mask and open the airway. Make sure you squeeze the mask with your thumb and index finger while lifting the jaw to achieve an airtight seal between the mask and the face. And squeeze the bag with your other hand or push it against your leg or body. If the chest doesn't rise with each breath, you're not providing adequate breaths. If you don't get chest rise, readjust the mask, reposition the head and neck, and try again to ventilate. And then, only if necessary, administer a larger amount of air, just enough to get chest rise. The critical points of delivering breaths remain the same for the bag mask device as for the pocket mask. Two breaths are given, with each breath given over one second after every set of 30 compressions. Be sure to deliver each breath over one second with just enough volume to make the chest rise. Delivering breaths in this way will reduce the chance of gastric inflation or air going into the person's stomach instead of the lungs. Gastric inflation can cause vomiting and possible aspiration. If you have multiple rescuers, the most effective way to deliver breaths with a bag mask device is to use the two person technique. One rescuer focuses on keeping the airway open and securing the mask. 
while a second rescuer squeezes the bag to deliver breaths, just enough to cause the chest to rise. The first rescuer will use both hands to seal the mask to the person's face and lift the jaw. The thumbs and index fingers of both hands each form a C to seal the mask against the face, and the three remaining fingers of each hand will form an E for lifting both sides of the jaw into the mask. Be careful not to press too hard on the mask, which could push the jaw down and block the airway. Now it's time to practice the one rescuer bag mask technique so that in a few minutes, we can combine it with compressions to work on a two rescuer sequence. We'll pause here to get into position. I think this one automatically pauses. Oh. So um, now, according to your lesson plan, mm -hmm. where you have your student position. Okay, so you're gonna have to position yourself at the head of the patient, mm -hmm. above the victim's head. Mm -hmm. And so remember, both over here, because your focus is student. Okay. So if you would just wanna read it now before you go over there. Okay. So you're gonna place the mask on the victim's face using the bridge of the nose as a guide for correct position. Okay. So using the Use the EC clamp technique to hold the mask in place while you lift the jaw to hold the airway open. So you can go there, you can see if he can get his breath, help him get his positioning. So you don't want to do too much here. Mm -hmm. This is a gastric inflation, like Lydia was saying. Mm -hmm. So that's what you try to do. And then your posture, it may end up hurting because you'd be in this position for about two or more minutes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So your posture and body mechanics is also important. And make sure you lift that jaw all well. Put those three fingers on the bottom. And make sure you have plenty of space here. One. Beautiful. Two. Yep, there's a good chest so rest. Keep Keep it open, keep the airway open, and you're gonna press play, and you're gonna watch him as he watches the video, okay? Now that we're ready, let's practice using the bag mask device. Follow along with the video. Here we go in three, two, one. Give two breaths. Watch for chest rise. One, two. That's good chest rise. Make sure you the span. Give two hand. breaths. It's over one second. One. There you go. Just like someone's breathing over there. You don't want to give two. Breaths. Give two breaths. One. Two. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Give two breaths. And give two breaths. Good. That's good. Remember, if you don't get that chest rise, you can reposition. You can mm -hmm. lift it open a little bit more. Make sure you have good that. Press down, press mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to press down too much. Just lift. Okay. okay. Perfect. So your students will look at you until you tell them what to do. And usually, once that video pauses, after they practice, they can always have a seat. Okay, you can have a seat. Start. So this is when I start leaving you, and I will come back. I'll be right over here. So I want to give you, I may help you, help you build your confidence. If you need anything, I'll be in the next room. But it's literally you're going to talk about um, breaths with the. Um, they're going to talk about um, mouth to mouth, and then after that, there's going to be a team, um, two rescuer. You're going to be rescuer number two. Okay. And he'll be rescuer number one. Let's move into special considerations. In this lesson, we focus on mouth-to-mouth -mouth breaths, rescue breathing, breaths with an advanced airway, opioid-associated life-threatening emergencies, and maternal cardiac arrest. This section shows how to give mouth-to-mouth -mouth breaths when a barrier device isn't available. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing is a quick and effective way to provide oxygen to a victim. Each breath you take contains about 21% oxygen. When you provide a rescue breath, 
That breath contains about 17% oxygen. This is why rescue breaths are effective in providing oxygen. Let's go through the steps to deliver mouth-to-mouth -mouth breaths. Start by holding the person's airway open with a head tilt chin lift. With your hand on the forehead, use your thumb and index finger to pinch the nose closed. Now, take a regular breath and seal your lips around the person's mouth, creating an airtight seal. Give one breath, blowing for about one second. Watch for the chest to rise as you give the breath. If the chest doesn't rise, repeat the head tilt chin lift. Give a second breath, blowing for one second while watching for the chest to rise. If you can't ventilate the person after two attempts, check for an airway obstruction, but then promptly return to chest compressions. Make sure you give each a breath over one second and deliver air just until you make the person's chest rise. Today, we've looked mostly at the procedures you should perform when someone does not have a pulse. But you should also know what to do if someone has a pulse but is not breathing effectively. When that happens, rescuers should give breaths without chest compressions. This is known as rescue breathing. For adults, give one rescue breath every six seconds. Also, give each breath over one second and make sure that each breath results in visible chest rise. During rescue breathing, you should also check the person's pulse about every two minutes. So now, according to your lesson plan, what do you do? All right, so you can position yourself over here. And we're just going to have you practice doing some res rescue breaths. Okay. Right. Say with the bag mount, is this using the same thing we just did? On the bag mount. I'm just talking to you. Okay, so you already did this. So mm -hmm. this is pretty much all you're doing. So you have to do this every six seconds. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. Get ready. Begin in three, two, one. Give one breath. That's good. Give one breath. Give one breath. Give one breath. Give one breath. <laughs> Give one breath. That's a one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand, one one thousand, six one. Give one breath. Mm -hmm. One one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand, five one thousand, six one thousand. Give one breath. Good chest rise. One one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand, five one thousand. Give one breath. One one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand, five one thousand, six one thousand. Give one breath. So what happens after two minutes? So you did rest your breathing for two minutes, and what do you do now? It said in, if, it said if in the video. Okay. What do you check? Oh, folks. Yes. All right. Show it later. Okay. It will show it later. Okay. Um, thank you for pointing that out. If you go to now on this page, we okay. did that. Now turn. Okay. Oh, High performance we teams. We didn't do a. 
advanced stairways. Okay, thank you so much. So what advanced stairway does the video not cover? What's the one here? Uh, the trait. Mm -hmm. So the video doesn't go over. So if someone has a trait right here, mm -hmm. uh, like a cup right here, yeah. it goes right to their lungs. Mm -hmm. And so say some you go across a patient that has that. Mm -hmm. So you treat that as advanced airway. So what you got to do. So this mask mm -hmm. can come off. And this, they usually, I think it's a universal fit. I forgot the fit, but it usually will fit into the, the, the actual tube that comes out. Okay. And you're going to do rest of your breathing just like you would once every six seconds. Gotcha. And you can do it continuously as they're doing compressions. That's it. Which I will talk about in this video. Okay. I'm so proud of you. I know, right? I'm going to go back to my home. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Okay, so another way to deliver breaths is with an advanced airway. Devices such as laryngeal mask airways, supraglottic airway devices, and endotracheal tubes are types of advanced airways that are more secure for providing breaths. These devices help prevent gastric inflation and airway obstruction. Placing these devices requires special training that we won't cover in this course, but you should know how to give breaths when an advanced airway is in place. When you provide CPR to someone with an advanced airway, the ratio of compressions to breaths changes. Instead of providing 30 compressions in two breaths, you'll perform continual compressions at a rate of 100 to 120 per minute while another rescuer gives rescue breaths. In other words, when an advanced airway is in place, you won't pause compressions to give breaths. This goes for victims of all ages and not pausing compressions allows blood flow to the heart and brain to remain high. An opioid-associated life-threatening emergency is... Do you have any questions on the advanced airways? Because it's going to go to opioids now. So the advanced airways, is that only for medical professionals? No, so you could come across anything. Like, say, like, it could, um... Well, yeah, it could be. It would, I guess it would be for more medical professionals. Say you're in a hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but oh. the, the traits, though, you could see anybody with that. Gotcha. And you could come across that, and you know... Yeah, like we do. You take us off, yeah. you attach it, you do that. Mm -hmm. But the other tubes are hospital. Yeah, the other tubes are in the hospital. Okay. What they would do, you would do the same thing with those and continuously give breaths as you're doing the compression. Perfect. Okay. And do you have any more questions? No, that's it. Okay. Some condition that might weaken or stop a person's breathing while they still have a pulse. Opioids are medications used primarily for pain relief. In high doses, these medications can cause a person to stop breathing or can even cause death. Naloxone is a medication that can reverse the effects of opioids and may restore normal breathing. Common ways to give naloxone are intravenous, intramuscular, and intranasal. If you suspect an opioid-associated life-threatening emergency in an adult who is unresponsive and isn't breathing normally but has a pulse, you should give one rescue breath every six seconds. Then, if your local protocol allows, give naloxone, but do not delay breaths to give naloxone. If the person does not have a pulse, you may give naloxone after starting CPR, but do not delay compressions. For further information on opioid-associated life-threatening emergencies, please consult your provider manual. What is naloxone? Treating. So nalox naloxone is another name for it is have you I don't know if you've heard of this Narcan. Yeah. So this is a Narcan administration device for your nose. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you so if you suspect an opioid emergency like the guy overdosed or anybody overdosed, you can do this and you push it like that. Okay. Do you have to hold it a certain amount or you just uh, switch your hand? So um, yeah, it'll go in and it'll stay in because it's single use only. Okay. okay. Um our um, training device the the plunger comes back out. Okay. You do got to be ready though, because when you give it to them, they could wake up very, right, right. very fast. Because okay. it binds to those opioid, those receptors, and it just reverses the effects of the opioids really quick. Okay. And it would give them breathing again. 
But you do have to monitor them after, of course, if you give it, and you have to keep, if you have to assess their breathing, mm -hmm. assess their pulse, because it doesn't work the first time all the time, especially if you're in a hospital, it could be a lot more, you can right. keep going, it could be days, like it, it's a very long process, but so a great process. Did I miss it, or how do I know if it's the hopefully going? Um, so hopefully you have um, some history of this person. You can just be walking down the street and maybe see drug paraphernalia. Right. And sometimes, especially if they're in a drug um, treatment clinic or something, mm -hmm. they're actually discharged with Narcan. A lot of your communities, okay. when they have people who are using um, drugs, mm -hmm. illegal drugs, they just start mass flooding the community oh. with Narcan. Okay. So if the person is in cardiac arrest, Narcan is not your priority. Gotcha. But gotcha. if you suspect or if you just happen to have some Narcan on right, you because right. you're in those communities, um, if you give it and they don't need it, it doesn't hurt them. Okay. But if you have somebody who's barely responsive but still breathing and you have that Narcan, you just never know who's on drugs. True. Go ahead okay. and give it to them. Okay, perfect. Do you have any more questions? No, that's it. Okay. Oh, if you have to use it, make sure you have now on the phone. Because he mentioned yeah. hospital, and the hospital will usually give IV. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Cardiac arrest in someone who's pregnant can come with heightened anxiety because two lives are at stake. In addition, some rescuers may be unfamiliar with handling the visible anatomy of a pregnant woman. The best outcome for both the mother and the baby depends on BLS rescuers summoning help, providing high quality CPR, and using an AED without delay. Compressions, ventilation, and AED use are mostly unchanged. If the abdomen is visibly rounded and additional help is available, Rescuers should manually displace the rounded abdomen to the mother's left side during compressions to help with blood flow to the heart. More information is available in your provider manual. So is that, excuse me, what, push the baby to the left? Yeah, so, let's see, okay, so pause. So if you like to see they're pregnant, obviously, and there's an extra person with you, mm -hmm. you can move this to the left. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's because there's a, the vein that goes to the heart, the inferior vena cava, you're pushing the bait, like the uterus is heavy and it's putting pressure on that. So it's causing less blood to go to the heart. Okay. So if you would, if somebody's there to manually displace the uterus to the left, okay. away from it, then it's good. You have more blood flow to the heart, you know, better, like better outcomes. Okay. Like that. All right. Matthew, that was the perfect explanation. Perfect. And then something else I will add is that if you haven't been taught to do that, for your job, mm -hmm. you keep doing those high quality compressions, right. and when the paramedics come, they will right. displace the abdomen. Okay. So don't forget it, because some people are just gonna be so afraid, we mm -hmm. can just get them to do chest compressions mm -hmm. um, and not worry about moving mom's belly, we're okay with that. Mm -hmm. okay. Perfect. So, and then after this pauses, the team dynamics is going to say high um, performance team activity, but it's gonna say optional. We don't do that if that's part of his role at his job. Um, what we're teaching, we would actually teach it because I'm teaching at hospital. They have to work together as a team around the bed. For him, you would um, not play it, just go down and go straight to pediatrics. Okay. Okay, it's going to say optional, and then it's going to say pediatrics. Okay. okay. What you are about to see will include the portrayal of advanced life support skills. As a BLS provider, you may be on a team with advanced life support providers, but rest assured, those skills are not part of this training. However, no matter the skill, procedure, or equipment used in a resuscitation event, BLS must continue. Successful teams not only have medical expertise and mastery of resuscitation skills, but they also practice good communication skills and adhere to the key elements of effective team dynamics. Team dynamics is an element of high performance teams and can be broken down into three categories, roles and responsibilities, what to communicate, and how to communicate. Clear roles and responsibilities should be immediately established by the team leader or the first rescuer on the scene. When all team members know their roles and responsibilities during a resuscitation attempt, the team functions smoothly. The ideal situation is when multiple rescuers work as a team to perform all the needed roles in a resuscitation attempt. 
This figure identifies six possible team roles for a resuscitation. Note that some roles are typically performed by advanced providers. If enough rescuers are present, each rescuer takes a role. If the team has fewer than six rescuers, some team members may be assigned more than one role. Some roles have a higher priority than others. The compressor assesses the victim and stays next to the victim's chest to perform chest compressions. When giving compressions, rescuers should switch compressors after every five cycles of CPR, about every two minutes or sooner if tired. The rescuer positioned by the victim's head maintains an open airway and delivers breaths while watching for chest rise and avoiding excessive ventilation. The team member operating the AED or the monitor defibrillator can also serve as the CPR coach. The role of the CPR coach is to focus on team members performance of high quality CPR and to provide feedback as needed during the resuscitation attempt. Every resuscitation team must have a defined leader who assigns roles and makes treatment decisions. Often, the team leader will be at the foot of the victim. However, the team leader may move around to observe and evaluate the skills of the team and to provide feedback when needed. The timer recorder keeps a record of the events that occur, including frequency and duration of interruptions and chest compressions, time of shock delivery, and medication administration. When only two rescuers are present, they typically take the roles of compressor and airway, with one of them also covering monitor defibrillator and team leader. If three rescuers are present, they take positions around the victim in the three critical roles, compressor, airway, and monitor defibrillator. Every member of the team should know his or her limitations. Team members should ask for assistance and advice early, not when the situation deteriorates. I'm getting pretty tired of these compressions. Do you need some help after this? Sometimes a team member or the team leader may need to correct actions that are incorrect or inappropriate. It's important to be tactful, especially if you need to correct a colleague before they make a mistake. And now you're too fast. Target for heart rate is 110. The next category is what to communicate. Knowledge sharing and summarizing information are critical components of effective team performance. Team leaders should review what's happened and ask for ideas and observations from team members. Can you give me a recap, Nick? Yes, we've been doing CPR for about four and a half minutes. We've got one shock, two no shocks, and you've given one uh, dose of epi -ID. Okay, so uh, anybody have any ideas on what else we can try with this patient? The last category is how to communicate. Closed loop communication is the process of verifying that the message sent was received as intended. It also verifies that any assigned tasks have been completed. So Scott, why don't you give one milligram of epinephrine? One milligram of epinephrine ID. In addition to using closed loop communication, teams should use clear messaging to help prevent misunderstandings. Teams that work together frequently can create terms or phrases that have specific meaning for them to ensure clarity among members. 145. Okay, let's go ahead and charge up. Charging. Charging. Do we have good pulses with CPR? Good thermal pulses with CPR still. Finally, teams need to communicate with respect. Speak to each other in a professional manner, regardless of scope of practice or expertise. Resuscitation events are stressful and emotions can run high. Understand that this is the nature of CPR and remain focused on the life you're trying to save. A high-performing team achieves specific performance metrics, including a high chest compression fraction, or CCF. CCF is the amount of time spent doing high-quality chest compressions during a cardiac arrest resuscitation attempt. You can only achieve a high CCF by eliminating pauses during high-quality CPR. The Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium Trials, or ROC Trials, showed that a 10% increase in CCF is roughly equal to an 11% increase in survival. Pauses typically occur during intubation, rhythm analysis, pulse checks, compressor switches, and defibrillation. We'll address some best practices for eliminating pauses in some of these areas, but you'll also need to measure high quality CPR metrics at your own place of practice 
to identify other areas where pauses exist. You cannot improve what you do not measure. So whenever compressions are paused, compressors should hover their hands over the chest and be prepared to resume compressions. As a BLS provider, you may notice that advanced providers check for a pulse, pre-charge the defibrillator, and prepare to deliver a shock about 15 seconds before pausing compressions at the end of each two-minute cycle. When using an AED, the prompts will instruct you when to pause. For example, during rhythm analysis or shock delivery. Switch compressors with the second compressor coming in from behind the first. This allows the second compressor to have the same view of the team, and in particular, of the AED or defibrillator. For seamless transitions, switching between cycles every two minutes is best. However, if a compressor needs to switch because of fatigue, coordinate the switch to happen as fluidly as possible, such as while delivering breaths. Three, two, one, switch. It's a best practice to use real-time feedback devices during CPR. However, if a feedback device isn't available, a metronome can help establish the proper rate. If your AED or defibrillator doesn't have a metronome, you can download a metronome app to your mobile device before the conclusion of this course. It's not enough to know what to do or even how to do it. To obtain the best results, your team must perform both the what and the how flawlessly. That requires practice, and effective practice requires measurement. But measurement is only effective if you debrief the team, set goals to improve, and practice more. Again, you cannot improve what you do not measure. For more information on how your team can implement this type of program, talk to your instructor. Do you understand that part? I know yeah. That's, I know that's probably new. That was new to me, too. Yeah, I, I wrote down. Okay. The higher CCF, the better, just because it's more yeah. compression. Right. You don't want to be doing that many compressions. All right. Let's see if they had a feedback or something. It's probably not just me. Now that we've covered adult BLS, let's discuss BLS for children. It may be difficult to imagine a child being a victim of cardiac arrest, but it certainly happens. Pediatric cardiac arrest isn't as common as adult cardiac arrest. In adults, the cause of cardiac arrest is often cardiac related, but in children and infants, cardiac arrest is often due to respiratory problems, such as airway obstruction, drowning, opioid overdose, or seizures. BLS for children is unique in certain ways, as can be seen in the chains of survival. In adults, cardiac arrest is often sudden and results from a cardiac cause. In children, cardiac arrest is often secondary to respiratory failure. Identifying children with these problems is essential in reducing the likelihood of pediatric cardiac arrest and improving chances of survival and recovery. Like the adult chains of survival, the pediatric chains have six links. Both pediatric chains include prevention of cardiac arrest, activation of the emergency response system, high quality CPR, advanced resuscitation, post cardiac arrest care, and recovery. In a hospital setting, the difference is the first link. It focuses on early recognition and prevention of cardiac arrest, which emphasizes patient monitoring and assessment. quality CPR for children includes these critical characteristics. Push hard and fast. Compress at a rate of 100 to 120 per minute with a depth of at least one third the depth of the child's chest. That's approximately five centimeters or two inches. And the chest must recoil completely between compressions. Minimize interruptions and in compressions to 10 seconds or less. Give effective breaths that make the chest rise and avoid excessive ventilation. 
If a child has an adequate pulse but isn't breathing normally, you'll have to give rescue breaths. Deliver one breath every two to three seconds, which is about 20 to 30 breaths per minute. Remember, when you're performing compressions on a child, it's fine to use one or two hands, whichever works for you and allows you to provide deep, effective compressions. Now, let's combine the BLS skills that you learned for adults with the differences we just reviewed to practice BLS for children. For this session, we'll practice two rescuer child CPR by using a 15 to two compression to ventilation ratio. One person will provide compressions while the other delivers breaths with a bag mask device. Switching roles every two minutes or sooner if the compressor becomes fatigued. says ask students to position themselves beside the mannequin. That part? Um, yes, and then thank you. Okay, so can you sit beside the sound of mannequin? All right, you will practice each role of the two rescuer child BOS sequence. And I will be rescuer two, you'll be rescuer one. And we're going to switch roles. Okay. So we're going to do both roles. So what's the ratio of those two rescuers for child CPR? It's 15 to 2. Yep. All right, perfect. So with an adult, it's always 30, 30 even if there's two. Mm -hmm. Infants and childs, which, what is the age for child? So like, when is someone considered an adult now? What do you think? Like 15, 16. Like puberty level. Puberty level. And how do you feel puberty? puberty? So like, okay. facial hair, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. the, the yeah. underarms, mm -hmm. So that would be, that's when you can do the switch from adult to child. Okay, all right. So we're gonna do this. So 15 to two. All right. And are you ready? No, I'm ready. We start off with a full session of tapping and shouting. Okay, all right, so that's gonna be the full session. All right. Okay. So let's count down to compressions and get started with two rescuer CPR for children, starting with scene assessment. To stay together, follow the prompts on the screen. Let's go in three, two, one. Hey, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Activate the emergency response and get an AED. I need an AED, please. Erotic pulse check, erotic pulse check. Rescue number two, go ahead and put that mask on. There's no breathing, no pulse. Compress, 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 compress. One, two, three, four, five, no. six, seven, eight, nine, ten. rescuers we need to keep that airway patent keep it open okay. so you keep it open and hold it open the entire time okay. i was also told by an ems instructor that it's like good i don't know if i should be telling people this or not but he likes to always keep it open just because it does like even though you're doing when you're doing compressions there's like a certain like yes it, residual air that yeah comes like in. you get yes. some air that'll come in just by keeping it open yes but mm -hmm. i, but I just that. like to remind them of that the fact that the child's area is so small mm -hmm. that every time they open and close they're building up secretions and on top of that they're just making the airway smaller okay, okay. So let's count down to compressions and get started with two rescuer CPR for children, starting with scene assessment. To stay together, follow the prompts on the screen. Let's go in three, two, one. All right, scene is safe, scene is safe. Hey, are you okay? 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 Are you okay
Activate the emergency response and get an AED. So we can film the same 15, channel of the video. Okay. We, just, we just pause it just for a moment so we'll let the video. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Great job, guys. I know the video's taking a while. Great job. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Great job. And then before we press play, what's the question? Do you have any questions? I don't. No. You think you got it? Oh, yeah. Good. I said 15 too. Just 15 too. And if there's like a really small child, it does say like one arm. Mm -hmm. it's just, you have to make sure you get that one third of the chest. Yeah. Okay, so there could be some big kids, you know what I mean? I was just about to say, can I just go by how big they are? Yeah, like it's subjective. Gotcha. It's not always like the same thing. I mean, right. you could have a 10 year old kid that's huge. Like, yeah, exactly. That's not a puberty. Like you need to do you got compression. All right. So what I like to think of, um, Tony, mm -hmm. is when in doubt, treat them like an adult. Gotcha. Perfect. If you can't tell, because I'm going to talk about infants next. If you can't tell if it's an infant or a one year old, treat it like a one year old. I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd rather you do more than less. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can okay. you do, I mean, only like a one or two year old. Mm -hmm. So that one year old would be, I'm yeah. sorry, less than one would be, but you have some big one year olds. Yeah, so, you're right. you're big, not big. so when in doubt, I'm not sure if I'm getting mm -hmm. one third, you can switch to the higher level technique. Okay, okay does that right. make sense? Yes. That's a big one year old, that's a big 11 month old. <laughs> if you're doing this, no, no, go ahead and use the palm of okay. your hand if you have to. Is there any signs, mm -hmm. let's say if it is an infant or big that, mm -hmm. and you go to the full one? What, 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 they're going to talk about infants because it wouldn't be two hands. Okay, it would be one. Yeah, right. or you can well, do two thumbs or you can do two okay, fingers. Right. So let's talk about infants. Sorry to get you distracted. Yeah. But, um, yeah, just so we, we're teaching you backwards. We talk yes. to adults, we teach you child, we teach you infant. Good. Someone brings you a baby, big baby. Yeah. You don't feel like you're getting it? There we yes. go. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Great job, young man. And then the bags are behind the babies. And our babies are sometimes a booger to work with. So if you don't see chest rise and fall, and usually you're going to see like your stomach move. Right. If you don't see it, pretend like you did. Okay, because we bought them from a manufacturer like this, and it was hard to ventilate. Okay, all right. That's my disclaimer for TV world out yes. here. <laughs> Yeah. Rescuing an infant can feel completely different from rescuing an adult, but the principles of CPR for infants who are younger than one year old are essentially the same as for adults. There are just a few differences, but those differences are significant. So let's take things in the same order we used for adult BLS. Right now, We'll talk about the skills for one and two rescuer infant CPR. First, if the cardiac arrest is witnessed, check the infant for a response and breathing. If the infant is unresponsive and isn't breathing or is only gasping, send someone to activate the emergency response system and get an AED. If you're alone and don't have a mobile phone, take the infant with you to phone emergency services, or if necessary, leave the infant and find a phone. But if no one witnessed the infant's collapse and there's no response or breathing, check for a brachial pulse immediately. If you do not detect a pulse, perform two minutes of compressions and breathing before activating emergency response, if it hasn't already been activated. If an infant has an adequate pulse but isn't breathing normally, rescue breaths may be required. Deliver one breath every two to three seconds, which is about 20 to 30 breaths per minute. To check an infant's brachial pulse, first place two or three fingers on the inside of the upper arm between the elbow and shoulder. Then press your index and middle fingers gently against the inside of the upper arm for at least five seconds and no more than 10 seconds. If there is no pulse, 
or if the heart rate is less than 60 per minute with signs of poor perfusion despite adequate oxygenation, begin CPR. To begin CPR, there are two options for hand and finger placement when performing compressions on an infant. The first technique is to place the tips of your two fingers on the sternum or breastbone in the center of the infant's chest just below the nipple line, but be careful not to press on the bottom of the breastbone. The other is the two thumb encircling hands technique. Place both thumbs side by side in the center of the infant's chest on the lower half of the breastbone. In very small infants, your thumbs may overlap. Don't apply any pressure on the tip of the breastbone. Now, encircle the infant's chest and support the back with the fingers of both of your hands. In this position, both thumbs will be used to depress the breastbone. Whether using the two finger or two thumb encircling hands technique, once in the correct position, push hard and fast to a depth of at least one third the depth of the chest or approximately one and a half inches or four centimeters. And the rate needs to be at least 100 to 120 compressions per minute. After each compression, allow the chest to recoil completely. As we get ready to practice infant chest compressions, remember these key points. Deliver compressions at the rate of 100 to 120 per minute. Make sure the depth of the compressions is at least one third the depth of the chest or approximately one and a half inches or four centimeters. Allow the chest to completely recoil after each compression and count out loud as you deliver 30 compressions. So let's get into position to practice compressions. Do you have any questions? All right, so this one is 30 compressions. What did I miss as the difference between the 15 and two? So single rescuer or two rescuers. So if it's just you, this oh, year gotcha. right. is 30. Okay. So if it's single rescuer, it's always 30 to two. Gotcha. No matter what age. It's the only thing when you get to two rescuers mm -hmm. for infants and child, it's gonna be 15 to two. All right. And it talked about compression techniques. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple, there's this, which I personally Never don't like doing it when I practice. Yeah, yeah. So I always do this, so the thumb is a lot easier after mm -hmm. that. Like that. Same compression rate. And do you have any other questions? No, that's good. Okay, so I turn it on now. Okay, do you want me, can I have him practice before the video or no? No, I think he has it. Okay, and um, it, I don't know if you caught the thing about saying uh, it's like the heart rate's under 60, or do you see sound, do you understand that? So, I need to be counting while I'm no, checking you, the pulse? Yeah, do you have any questions? Like, if you think it, like it's too slow, it's like it's not even one time a second. Like you don't even get that, mm -hmm. and you see like blue hands and like cyan like cyanosis, like on the extremities, it's blue, mm -hmm. the baby doesn't look like they're like, breathe like getting perfusion, okay. you start CPR. Right, okay. Even though they have a little bit of a pulse, mm -hmm. this is not enough to keep them alive as, for, as an infant. All right, okay? Yep. All right, so we're gonna do practice while watching. All right. Let's go in three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty. Long pause, you would ignore the response in the real world. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. So this time we'll be using the best, but it's for the video. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Good job, Good job.
for our reason now. Rescuer CPR infants. Okay. Now it's time to practice two rescuer infant CPR. But before we begin, let's note a couple of differences between one rescuer and two rescuer infant CPR. One difference is the hand and finger placement for giving compressions. In two rescuer infant CPR, the person doing compressions should always use the two thumb encircling hands technique. Here are the specs. Place both thumbs side by side in the center of the infant's chest on the lower half of the breastbone. In very small infants, your thumbs may overlap. Do not apply any pressure on the tip of the breastbone. Now encircle the infant's chest and support the infant's back with the fingers of both of your hands. In this position, use both thumbs to depress the breastbone at least one third the depth of the infant's chest, or approximately one and a half inches or four centimeters. The other key difference between one rescuer and two rescuer infant CPR is the compression to ventilation ratio. As mentioned before, instead of a 30 to two ratio in a one rescuer situation, two rescuers should use the ratio of 15 compressions to two breaths. So let's practice compressions for two rescuer CPR. As a reminder, make sure your rate is between 100 to 120 compressions per minute. Use the 15 to two compression to ventilation ratio because you have two rescuers. Make the compressions approximately one and a half inches or four centimeters deep. Allow the chest to fully recoil after each compression and count out loud for your partner. Time to practice two rescuer infant CPR, starting with scene assessment. We will pause here while you get into position with the mannequins. Matthew, before you press play, uh, make sure that you learn how to do both ways. Okay. Do you know why it's 15 to 2 for infants and not for adults? Do you have any idea? Or any guess what you like to take? Because knowing why would help you remember, that's why I was. No. So, Usually the problems when they go into car cardiac arrest, oh. it's more breathing problems. For the adults, it's more like long-term chronic like heart disease. Right. Babies, it's usually like some type of breathing problem. Could be okay. croup, could be like obstruction, could be anything that's like, because mm. they have, like it's more, they're having a breathing. So that's why it's more, you get more breathing with okay. infants than with adults. Okay. And so show me where you would check a brachial pulse on infant. All right, I'm here. Yep. So how do you know how to find one on yourself? Like where you I don't, I've never. Like okay. imagine like a small arm right here. Mm -hmm. So it's right under your bicep, okay. right here. Like push up in your bicep. It's under that muscle. Maybe a little harder. Mm -hmm. It's one of the harder ones to find on adults. Babies, it's usually okay. a lot easier to find. Okay. So you go right here, okay? On the underside of the bicep. Right. That's where that artery is. All right. All right. So we're going to do this. Parents are going to watch You think like, you're ready for it? No, oh, yeah, I'm ready. Right. Two rescuers, so I did the. really fast, you all, and remember no legs when you're trying to keep the airway open on the baby. Oh. Okay. Wait, no, none at all? No, just your hands, the baby's airway is just the head is so small, you won't need any other. Okay. Here we go in three, two, one. Safe, safe, safe. Hey, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Great job. That's a good job. What Check for breathing. That's good. Activate the emergency response. You get an AED. There is no breathing and no pulse. One, two, two three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Thumbs up. Just thumbs up. Remember, stay in position. But thumbs up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine ten, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Great job. Just thumbs up. Great job. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Three cycles, if you all would change positions. There you go. Great job. 
sorry. I um, I came back and I saw what you did, so now I'm gonna go back in my room over there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very proud of you too. Great job. Here we go in three, two, one. All right, stand safe, stand safe. Hey, are you okay? Are you okay? Activate the emergency response. Give me the response. There's no breathing, and no pulse. One, two, three, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Good job. For video purpose, we're going to stop right now. But you got that right? Mm -hmm. So, babies, we all, I was told you don't have to do this. Okay. All right. But you do, should like, it's like a sniffing, mm -hmm. that's what I've heard. You go like right around here. Okay. Like a midway point. You don't want to do too much because you can hurt them. Because they have a bigger head. They have like their head proportion is bigger than the other I got you. Yeah. So you want it to be like right around here. Excellent. And it should work with most mannequins. It should only allow ventilations when it's in that like perfect. Perfect. All right. All right. So next. Good job, nephew. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now this one's going to discuss ADD use. Okay. okay. some children. There are some differences when you're using an AED for infants and children younger than eight years old. Some AEDs can deliver either an adult shock dose or a child dose for children younger than eight years old. A pediatric capable AED will have features that allow a child appropriate shock, but the available features depend on the type of AED you're using. Your AED may also include smaller sized pads that are designed for children younger than eight years of age. If it does, use them. If not, use the adult pads, but make sure that they do not touch or overlap, but never use the child pads for an adult. The shock dose delivered by child pads is too small for an adult and likely won't be successful. It's better to provide high quality CPR than attempt to shock an adult with child pads. Some AED pads recommend placing one pad on the chest and one pad on the back for infants and children. Follow the pictures on the pad packages for proper placement. If an infant needs defibrillation, a manual defibrillator is preferred. But as we mentioned before, this device is quite different from an AED and it requires special training that is not included in this course. If a manual defibrillator is not available, an AED with a pediatric dose attenuator is preferred. But if neither is available, you may use an AED without a pediatric dose attenuator. So it says optional. Can I do it though? What is it? It says like for, it's like the students practice, have performance activity, skill steps, optional for the, the AED. So what I do is if the pads are overlapping, where would you place the pad on a child or an infant? You said if the pads overlap? Mm -hmm. So like they should never touch. Right, okay. okay. So right hand on the back. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And so without having him get up and do all that, he has already shown that he's competent in the area. Mm -hmm. So you really don't have to get up and practice it. Okay. okay. So it just depends on, on your student. Mm -hmm. okay. And remember, even though you're placing it right here in the doing C part there, mm -hmm. I mean, you put that on real quick and then you can use it. Less compression, like the less, like, the better CPF, CCF, the better. And then you can also do the same thing, put on the back real quick, just the better the All right. More Very good. All right, so now we're going to talk about the need of choking in adults or When food or other items block a person's airway, 
choking occurs. In a severe airway obstruction, the person usually has signs of poor air exchange and breathing difficulty, such as a silent cough, an inability to speak or breathe, or cyanosis, that is, turning blue. Adults or older children who are choking may clutch their neck with both hands, making the universal choking sign. If someone indicates that they are choking and cannot talk, you must act. For someone who is standing, you'll perform an abdominal thrust. To perform an abdominal thrust, stand or kneel behind the person and place your arms around the waist. With one hand, locate the navel. Then make a fist with your other hand and place the thumb side of your fist against the person's abdomen, just above the navel and below the breastbone. Grasp your fist with the other hand and press your fist into the abdomen with a quick, forceful upward thrust. Repeat thrust until the object is expelled from the airway or the person becomes unresponsive. If you can't wrap your arms around the waist because the person is pregnant or overweight or simply can't stand, wrap your arms around their chest and give chest thrusts instead of abdominal thrusts. So I'll pause it here just to verify that you know how to do the abdominal thrust. If you're not... Yeah, do you understand? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to go... So the xiphoid process again, it's this middle part right here, the little bony part. Right. You don't, you want to go under that. So you don't want to break the xiphoid process and there's a lot of things under it. So you want to go right here, you're going to do right this, this, and you're going to go up, like up, because you want to push that stuff out. All right. So, okay. Alright. You're going to attend the adults. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Also ask about a pregnant person, because usually they try to go up and Okay, I didn't know if it would catch on this. Okay. So pregnant, so if somebody's pregnant, what do you think you would do? So, you go yep, yeah. you go chest thrust. So what do you think? Do you think you still go up or do you think it's too late? What do you think? Uh, we still go up? Nope, no, just, just go, go right in. in. Right. Yep, just go right in. Okay, cool. cool. able to relieve choking in an adult or child, or if the person becomes unresponsive, have someone activate the emergency response system. Then lower the person to the ground and begin CPR. Perform CPR as usual, but with one difference. Each time you open the airway to give breaths, look for the obstructing object in the back of the throat. If you see an object that can be easily removed, carefully remove it. But do not perform a blind finger sweep because this may cause the object to become lodged farther back in the airway. Choking is also a fairly common emergency in infants. The steps to relieve choking in an infant are quite different from those. Did you understand that part, what he was talking about? Yes. So, mm -hmm. so every time you open the airway, make sure you check it. Yeah. No blind finger sweep, though. No blind finger sweep? No, you can't. If you don't say anything, don't do a blind finger sweep. Mm -hmm. You right. could damage the palate, you could damage all sorts of stuff, and you would end up doing more harm than good. Mm -hmm. So only if you could see it. Okay. That's like a big, that's a big thing. Gotcha for older children and adults. If you find an infant who is choking but is still responsive, first sit or kneel with the infant in your lap. Hold the infant face down and resting on your forearm with the head slightly lower than the chest. Support the head and jaw with your hand. Avoid compressing the soft tissue of the infant's throat. Then rest your forearm on your thigh to provide support. With the heel of your other hand, deliver up to five forceful back slaps between the infant's shoulder blades. Deliver each slap with sufficient force to attempt to dislodge the foreign body. Then place your free hand on the infant's back, supporting the head with the palm of your hand. This will cradle the infant between your two forearms as you turn the infant over while carefully supporting the head and neck. Keep the infant's head lower than the chest and deliver up to five quick downward chest thrusts in the same location where you would perform compressions, just below the nipple line, over the lower half of the breastbone. Do this at the rate of about one per second. Repeat the sequence of five back slaps and five chest thrusts until the object is removed or until the infant becomes unresponsive. Alright, so now we're going to do another practice while watching. Do you, Andre, have any questions before you start? No. Okay. So, do you understand how it's done? Okay. Are you going to take questions? Or are you going to take So, just like this. Like this. Alright. So, five back slaps. Mm -hmm. 
for like one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. Go forward. Make sure the head is lower. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five. And repeat. Okay. It says sitting, but you're not always going to be able now to sit. Now that you're in position, oh, let's begin. Follow along with the video as you practice. Here we go in three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. I'm trying to push it out. Push it out? Yep. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. She's trying to dislodge everything. One, two, three, four, five. Good job. Okay. Place it down. As with an adult, if a choking infant becomes unresponsive, shout for help and have someone activate the emergency response system. Then lay the infant face up on a hard, flat surface. You'll perform CPR as usual, but with one difference. Each time you open the airway to give breaths, look for the object. To give breaths for an infant, the mouth to mouth and nose technique is preferred. For this technique, you will first open the infant's airway with a head tilt chin lift. Then place your mouth over the infant's mouth and nose to create an airtight seal. Give one breath blowing for about one second. Watch for the chest to rise as you give the breath. If the chest does not rise, repeat the head tilt chin lift to reopen the airway and try to give a breath that makes the chest rise. If you cannot cover the infant's mouth and nose with your mouth, use the mouth to mouth technique instead. The mouth-to-mouth -mouth technique for an infant is the same as for an adult. If you can see the object, carefully try to remove it. Never perform a blind finger sweep. You should only try to remove an object if you can see it. If you're alone, after about two minutes or five cycles of CPR, activate the emergency response system. We'll pause here while you get into position to practice with the infant mannequins. You stand up. Oh, actually. Yeah, it doesn't say anything about the practice. Yeah, it doesn't say anything about the practice. So. Alright. Alright, so we're going to watch this video. But you understand? Oh, another point. When you're doing the finger sweep mm -hmm. and you're like looking for the, the thing that's like an out of the stroke, mm -hmm. for infants, you want to use your pinky, okay. the smallest one. Or I guess you. Gotcha. So you don't want to use a big one because your mouth is small. You're just gonna end up scratching stuff. You could tear the epiglottis or something. Yeah. Yeah. But like, you know, try to be careful. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. Especially like, yeah. Okay. And never blind fingers. Gotcha. We covered a lot today. You learned the proper BLS rescue techniques of CPR and the use of an AED for all age groups the importance of effective teamwork, as well as how to perform in a one rescuer or two rescuer scenario. You've also learned rescue breathing and what to do for someone who is choking. Thank you very much for your time and attention today, and especially for your commitment to learning these critical life-saving techniques. We appreciate and honor the important work you all do as healthcare professionals. Great job. I'm so proud of you. Um, very proud of you. Proud of you also. And so I always like to do a takeaway. A takeaway of something new or something that was reinforced because we had a lot of students. This is a renewal course for them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start off with you. I want you to tell us from the student standpoint 
then I want you to give us a takeaway from a new instructor standpoint. And congratulations. So once he takes his test and pass, we issue his card and you have completed your instructor process. All right, so please give us a takeaway. So I would say the terminology for me, yes. um, and like you said, why we're doing what we're doing is because I only took the AAP, uh, the um, CPR. Brand. Yeah, exactly. That definitely helps. Yeah. Um, and then seeing like how American Heart Association instructors teach versus other exactly. instructors. Right. Um, yes. no, we, we, he did not say that. He did not say that on camera. <laughs> and so, well, thank you for choosing us. And how did you hear about Florida Training Academy? Uh, online search. Okay. Yes. We love it. We love it. Well, thank you. And hopefully, you'll be in this position next week okay. and we can get you certified as an instructor. Yes, ma'am. I'm ready. Matthew, the instructor process. What, um, my question is going to be a little bit different. What was your expectations coming in, and how do you feel now that you've completed this initial part? My expectation was that it was going to be like I was going to I was like trying to think of ways to describe the things that they were saying. So I want to give like the background like why you have to do this. Yes. And I was like trying to think of that before I came here, and I was like I knew it was going to be like tough to get the words out like the first time. So then my first time. Doing you it. did very well. So I want to be able to like, because I want to give people background on like, what, like, I can't just like, oh, it's 15 like this reason, like, have to right. do it. Because it makes you remember it more if you like know why you're doing it. Definitely. And like, it actually, like, it makes you want to do it and like follow the rules and like, do it the right way. And I've had an instructor here once. He would literally just try to sit down and press play. He didn't stay here long. Gotcha. Gotcha. Because you have to be relatable. And if they just needed a computer, they could have stayed home Easy. and watched the computer. Right. So, having that instructor who actually has the background and who actually studied to make sure that they can simplify the words. Right. All right, so you prepared very well, you attended the course, what are your thoughts now? I love it. I feel like I learned, learned CPR better just by being an instructor. Like I feel like I'm a lot more confident with everything. And I just know I'll get better and better the more I do it. That's right, all right, that's what I needed to hear. So what happens from here? We can actually give you a restroom break if you need one, a coffee break, a water break, whatever you need. Um, you'll be taking a 25 question multiple choice examination. Okay. At the end, Matthew will grade your test. Once you pass, which we know you will, he'll issue your card. Matthew, from here, will complete your monitoring tool. I'll show you the checklist. Um, so there's like one more step. Those checklists that we had you complete during the course, you're supposed to read the scenario, and now he's supposed to re-demonstrate everything that we have done practice while watching. And now he can be able to do it without the video because you've taught him so well. Okay. And that will be like conclusion of our paperwork. Evaluations are all electronic, so you can print out evaluations so that you get feedback in real time. If my students don't like me, they tell Google. So I don't <laughs> print off paper evaluations. Um, whenever you claim your e-card, it's going to give you an opportunity to evaluate your instructor, and um, that's when you can give us an evaluation, and that goes directly to the American Heart Association. Okay. You'll be able to, um, you have your test. Um, I'll send you the link that shows you how to access the Atlas system. It may take a few days before you're able to issue your own e-cards and activate your own um, or get access to the portal, but you are officially official. All right, All right. so everybody, again, this is Eunice Mattis with Florida Training Academy. We have a great class. It was a long video, but if you are an instructor or if you're interested in becoming an instructor, we hope this helped. All right, have a great day, everybody. Signing off.